friends, colleagues. It is my pleasure, first of all, to welcome you to the London Academy of <coughs> I do apologize for my, my voice, but I've lost my voice. Um, I would wish to welcome you to the London Academy of Diplomacy. Thank you for making it today. This is our special edition of the Diplomatic Forum. I am extremely happy to have here with us His Excellency Eurypides Evlivadis, I hope I said it properly, who comes, who comes from a sister island, if I may say, our sister island. I come also from another island. But we've always considered our friends from Cyprus as really any meeting that you the EU organizes, normally you'll find the Cypriots next to the Maltese, or the Maltese next to the Cypriots. Because we share tradition, we share history, we share also the Mare Nostrum. The Italians say, Mare, the, 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 the Latin say Mare Nostrum, the Italians have used that word, but it's also our, see. So I'm extremely pleased to have a very, very knowledgeable person uh, who is here with us today. We organize the Diplomatic Forum every Tuesday, as you know, but this is a special edition of this, of this forum. Why? Because we wanted to concentrate as well on one of the big issues which is everybody is speaking about, which is the Mediterranean. And I hope that today we'll be speaking about Cyprus, we'll be speaking about the EU, but we'll also be speaking about the Eastern Mediterranean, which is close to our heart. Now, before I start, I would like to introduce to you Many of you, we have uh, ambassadors here, high commissioners, but many of you know the high commissioner. I would like the rest of us who do not perhaps know so much about him to know more about him before he actually gives the lecture. So uh, if you would permit me, I would like to say, say something about that. The high commissioner has taken up his post on the, his post on the 4th of November 2003 13. Before assuming this post, he was the Deputy Permanent Secretary and the Political Director, Political Director of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of the Republic of Cyprus. He has served as Ambassador Permanent Representative to the Council of Europe, chaired as Rapporteur on External Relations. He was also the Political Director of the Ministry and also having concurrent accreditation to the State of Kuwait pro tem from Nicosia. The High Commissioner was also Ambassador to the United States of America and non-resident High Commissioner to Canada, serving as well as Permanent Representative to the International Civil Aviation Organization, the Permanent, Observation, the, the Permanent Observer to the OAS, which is one of the partners of the London Academy of Diplomacy. He has also served as Ambassador to the Netherlands, to Israel. Early in his career, he had positions at the separate embassies in, in Germany, in Bonn, in Moscow, then USSR in Russia, and also we have here some our friends from Libya, in Libya, in Tripoli. He started his diplomatic career in 1976 at the Cyprus Consulate in General New York as Vice Consul, and worked his way up, I must say. He has published articles on the subject of maritime and the law of the sea, as well as, as, well as on the Cyprus question, on security issues of the Eastern Mediterranean, and also on diplomacy. On the 15th of January 2016, he has received in Washington DC the King Legacy Award for International Service bestowed upon him by the Committee, by the committee on the International Salute to the Life and Legacy of Dr. Of Dr. Martin Luther King. He was honored in The Hague as the Ambassador of the Year. Also, um, other decorations include the Great Commander of the Order of the Orthodox Knights of the Church of the Holy Sepulchre in Jer Jerusalem and the Order of Merit of the Federal Republic of Germany in 1989. The High Commissioner holds a master's degree in public administration from the John F. Kennedy School of Government, Harvard University, which he attended as a Fulbright fellow. He graduated cum laude in 1976 with a Bachelor of Science degree in Business Administration from the University of New Hampshire. He was born in Larnaca, Cyprus, on the 6th of August, 1954. He is married to Anastasia, Anastasia, an attorney at law. He has also an avid interest in the arts, especially music, as well as antiquities, cartography, and motorcycling. 
and I would like to end that he is also the recipient of the recent award of the EU Diplomat of the Year for Europe in London, voted by his peers and the diplomatic community at large in the UK. This is his latest accolade. Allow me to add one other word. He has always, always, from the time that I've known him, to be a great supporter of continuous professional development and education, which is one of the things that we do here at the London Academy of Diplomacy. So I, like many of you in this room, look forward to hearing his views as a matter not only of interest, but also of education, which I think is extremely important. He has been, um, I will not use the word High Commissioner, a great ambassador, one of the great ambassadors of the EU here in London, in my opinion. And uh, I, I, I feel, no, 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 I, 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 and I wanted to give the, I wanted to do the speech myself, by the way, <laughs> because, uh, Don Charles was <laughs> today. Um, because I feel that, you know, your, your devotion to the, to, to, to the world of diplomacy, as many of your colleagues here, yeah, has been extremely important. And here, as you are aware, we have a number of students, candidates, some of them diplomats, who should learn from this eater, professional eater. Thank you very much. Thank you very, very much, Joseph. And, and uh, I would like to, before beginning, to pay tribute to my colleagues in the, in the in the diplomatic community because I feel a little bit awkward of what you said about Diplomat of the Year because we're not in a competition of any sorts. You know, we are all equal, we, all of us are very, very professional. Some things happen because they happen, but we have excellent colleagues, excellent collective, uh, collective uh, uh, experience. I, lo I would like to pay tribute to my colleagues from Lithuania, Luxembourg, Hashemite Kingdom of Jordan, the ambassadors, former ambassador of Yemen, and all the colleagues that are here, very nice of you to come. I feel enriched by your presence. Thank you very much for coming. Because uh, the most important thing that we have is, of course, our family, our health, but also our time. So when colleagues and friends and each one of you here that comes to spend time to listen to somebody like me, is doubly appreciated because you're giving me part of your time. So I hope it's going to be your worthwhile. Uh, I want to thank you, Professor. I want to thank you, Joseph, and all the stakeholders, uh, Barry, Deborah, for, for making this event possible. Uh, the lad is close to my heart, the London Academy of Diplomacy, because if it did not e exist, we would have had to invent it. Because it's really taking diplomacy in a new level, in the sense that it is no longer practiced by just diplomats, but many, many actors. Diplomacy has diffused itself. It was uh, 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 Sir Henry Watson in the 17th century that said that a diplomat, an ambassador, is an honest man set, sent abroad to lie for the good of his country. <laughs> now, but the same Sir Watson also said, speak the truth. And by speaking the truth, so puzzle your adversaries. So I'm here to speak the truth. And I'm here to be interrogated by you. So after my presentation, please feel free to grill me. Feel free to ask any question that you, you care that comes to your mind on the topic that, uh, that uh, I'm going to be touching upon, or anything else for that matter, with pleasure, because there's uh, students, there's everybody else, whatever you want to talk. Uh, the topic that I have chosen is Cyprus, the EU, and the Eastern Mediterranean. Uh, admittedly, it's a tall order. It is a tall order because for every single topic, Cyprus, EU, and the Eastern Mediterranean, on in, on every single topic there or a dossier, uh, one can have, uh, can have a, a talk about it. But in an interdependent world, in a world where it is unwind, where one event is linked on something else, what I'm going to try to do, and I hope I'm going to be able to do it uh, in the time allotted, is to try to connect the dots. Try to connect the dots and in order, in order to put the whole thing into perspective. So it is Cyprus, the EU, the Eastern Mediterranean, <coughs> just a punchline, a sales pitch. Feel free to follow me on Twitter. <laughs> but there is also a hashtag for the event, so feel free to use that as well. Uh, OK, please. Now, Cyprus, this 
is part of my collection. This is an old original map of Cyprus of 1647 by Blau, and it shows Cyprus as one of course country for all the people, undivided, no dividing lines. Here is Aphrodite, the goddess of love and beauty, who could have been born any place on earth. Yeah, she decided to be born in Cyprus for a reason. Okay, she's, no, no please go back. Uh, uh, these are the swans. These are land birds, right there. Aphrodite cubic. And Aphrodite is being pulled by the swans to be born in Paphos, where she rose from the waves. Please. There is a statue of her. It's nice of you to meet her, uh, which was founded in Cyprus, of course. And there is also, anybody that is interested, there is hashtag defining beauty at the British Museum, where uh, she's there as well. So you can meet her, and she's wonderful, and she's very, very beautiful. Please. Here's her birthplace. Some of the beaches, some of the mountains. Uh, religion, Greek Orthodox Church, uh, 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 um, uh, Teke Sultan, a, a mosque, and archaeology. I start with these as a sales pitch to begin with to wet your appetite because I want you to visit Cyprus, but also to tell you that I haven't been here for a year and a half when I come across people that know Cyprus, basically they have either fixed, they have fixed ideas of what a country is. We all do when we talk about a country. In the case of Cyprus, it, it is culture, it is archaeology, please go, no, no, to front, here, okay. In the case of Cyprus, there is an interfix, there is an idea that Cyprus is about culture, archaeology, tourism, or a problem, okay? Now, I'm here to give you another narrative. I'm here to to convince you, I'm here to tell you that it's part of the solution and not part of the problem. Cyprus is not just that. It is a member of the United Nations, the Commonwealth, the Council of Europe, the, EU, the European Union. When we talk about Cyprus, because very often I'm asked, which part of Cyprus are you from? Are you the Republic? Are you uh, Greek Cyprus, are you Turkish Cyprus, are you South Cyprus, are you, are you North? Well, terminology is important. No Greek Cyprus, no Turkish Cyprus, no North, no South. South. Cyprus does not belong to either Greece or Turkey. It is an independent country and it belongs only to its people, irrespective of their ethnic background, be they Turkish Cypriots, Greek Cypriots, Armenians, Maronites, or Latins. The self-declared Turkish Republic of Northern Cyprus has been repeatedly condemned by the United Nations, but Cyprus plays an important role and aspires to take it to the next level in furthering the values and ideas of the European Union in the strategic corner of the Eastern Mediterranean. It has excellent relations with all countries in the region, except regrettably one, and we are really looking to the day where this would not be so, and I will be explaining why. Next <coughs> In terms of foreign policy, it is based, of course, on the UN principles of the UN Charter. It is based on the EU, because the moment the Foreign Affairs Council, the moment the European Council decides on an issue, e.g. Ukraine, e.g. Middle East, e.g. Yemen, then automatically it becomes part of our own foreign policy by virtue of the membership. So its foreign policy is UN-oriented, UN principles, uh, EU principles and values, but believes in a rules-based international legal system. Why? Because that system, objectively and effectively administered, it is to safeguard its own rights as a, as a small country. Because big countries are big countries. But being a big country, obviously, whoever big country it is, doesn't give you the license to violate international law with impunity. So, rule of law cooperation, understanding, tolerance, dialogue with all the neighbors is the bedrock of interstate relations, peace, stability, economic development, and in solving disputes. A credible, predictable, and reliable partner of the West that is a security producer, despite its size, plays important role in promoting security and stability in its in, in volatile immediate neighborhoods. But we also aspire <coughs> to be a pillar for the implementation of the EU's energy policy. 
uh, and planning by making the Eastern Mediterranean a reliable source, another corridor, the fourth corridor, uh, to, for energy to the European Union uh, and in order for, uh, for uh, security of, uh, energy security of Europe. Next, please. This is, the, of course, the geography. Cyprus, Lebanon, Jordan, Syria, Israel, Egypt. Frightfully simple. Geography is destiny. I can deny my family. I can deny anything. My friends, I cannot deny my geography. It is there. I cannot take Cyprus and pull it next to Luxembourg, as beautiful that would have been, because my history would have been different. I am stuck there. So, and with all these countries in the region. No island is an island. Despite the fact that we are an island, no island is an island because we live in an, in an interconnected, entwined world. It's a global village. An attack of terrorism in Indonesia, Bali attack, affects us here in London. This is what we have to understand. Okay? Despite this small size and limited military capabilities, Cyprus's geographical position gives it another dimension. And this is what I'm trying to talk to you. It is at the crossroads of the continents, Europe, Asia, Africa, an interconnecting bridge. This is our flag information region. Here it is, right here. Okay. There is the, 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 the uh, uh, Jordan, uh, Tel Aviv, Cairo here. But, so you get a sense that the country is small, of course it is. At the same time, when it comes to the flight information region, when it comes to exclusive economic zones and maritimes, islands, because we do have a lot of islands in the Commonwealth, are no longer so small. Are no longer so small. I mean, they're small, of course, you cannot, uh, we're not oblivious to reality. Many islands in the Commonwealth. But when you put it all together, then, uh, then uh, with the green uh, uh, economy and development and hydrocarbons and energy, so it's not so small. And you see what's happening in, in Asia about fighting about islands. Why? It's not just a, a rock. It, there's, there's a lot more to it, please. Now, Cyprus and the European Union. For centuries, Cyprus's geographical strategic location was, politically speaking, more of a curse than a blessing. It was a blessing in terms of archaeology, a blessing in terms of the fusion of the many conquerors <coughs> that came to Cyprus, but politically, it's more of a curse than, than, uh, than a blessing. But of course, the challenge is to change that to an opportunity. Okay. Now, the Syrians, the Ptolemies, Persians, Romans, Byzantines, Venetians, Ottomans, or British that conquered Cyprus for all the ages. Cyprus acceded to the EU in 2004, together with nine other countries, including Lithuania. Uh, we had the Big Bang in 2004. Now, it is the single most important strategic development that happens to Cyprus since independence in 1960. And despite the many faults that people will find the European Union, despite the fact of the debate that is happening in this country, the European Union, no matter what anybody says, is the single most important political, successful construction in geopolitics. The single most important, it is the European Union, despite its faults. Therefore, its hallmark has been to extend the zone of peace and stability to the countries that it has engulfed. Think where Europe was 50, 60 years ago. Think that this European continent of civilized nations was highly uncivilized by creating the gas ovens of Europe, by annihilating 6.7 million Jews, and many, many others. We just say about uh, the Jewish Holocaust, which was, which was correct, but was many, many others, millions that were also annihilated. This was happening on this continent. The European Union managed to solve it. The European Union managed to solve the German question, pacified the Balkans, reunified the continent, and of course the experiment is not going to be complete unless the Balkans come uh, 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 into the, its fold as well. Therefore, its hallmark 
of the European Union has been to extend the zone of peace and stability to the countries that it has engulfed. Now, here comes my punchline. By its extension, the European Union, by its extension to the Eastern Mediterranean, by virtue of Cyprus, it means that the, its hallmark of peace, stability, and all these things that we know about extends itself in the Eastern Mediterranean. That's hugely important. And, and I hope that in the end, all these things will come together. And I said, if they don't, you know, interrupt me. You can, you can stop me while I'm talking, because I want to make sure that I don't lose anybody. Because if you do not understand something, it's because I am not expressing it correctly, and I'm not expressing it nicely. OK, so Cyprus, the easternmost country in the EU, demonstrated completely that it can be, uh, can be a lichpin and play a responsible and dec decisive role in the European Union on those issues that I've said. And we have a long way to go. Uh, sorry, please. Another one. The Mediterranean, the, the Eastern Mediterranean, a region in turmoil and flux. My brother from, from Jordan here, the distinguished ambassador of the Hashemite Kingdom of Jordan, he is much more learned than I am, and he will be able to also tell you in the future what the region means. I don't want to start telling you individually, but what can I say? ISIS in Iraq, Libya, Syria, Lebanon, Middle East peace process, and we can call it a process. We cannot really call it a process. We cannot uh, call it uh, uh, peace. If we can call it as such, the humanitarian situation in Gaza and the entire region, Yemen, illegal migration, unpredictability. So the Eastern Mediterranean friends spells and means security, it means sea lanes, it means air corridors, it means the Suez Canal, it means energy, it means asymmetrical threats. And the very same things that we have invented that unify us are the very same things that the others using against us. Please. Needless to state the obvious that the Mediterranean is of pivotal importance not for the just for the countries in the region, but also for European security. It cannot be a theater. We don't like it to be a theater of instability and conflict. Uh, historically, when Europe disengaged itself from the Eastern Mediterranean, detached itself, itself from the Eastern Mediterranean, problems and violence ensued for the entire European continent. Important for all the countries, like I said, in, in the region. Cyprus, Egypt, Israel, Lebanon, Syria, Turkey, Lebanon, uh, uh, Jordan, of course, even though it's not immediately uh, on the shores, Palestine, but like I said, the United Kingdom and the wider European continent. Now, we need to enhance that structure. We need to take it to the next level. We need to move this architecture further. No lacunas. We need predictability because the threats, in many ways, are existential. When ISIS on the beach of Libya beheads people, and all these subhuman crimes, subhuman, pure evil crimes that ISIS is doing, is sending us a message. I have no question about it. It is sending us a message that the Mediterranean is a message. They took, uh, what was it, uh, uh, on their, or their pages, on their web pages, at any given time, 30,000 web pages uh, go going on. St. Peter's Cathedral with ISIS, uh, with ISIS uh, flag on it. So it is not just, I'm not saying Christians, Muslims, I will never get into the argument of, of a class of civilizations. If anything, it's a class of ignorance, but it is what it is. And we have to define it as such so we can use the correct medicine. So the EU needs predictable, credible, and reliable partners, which they can, they will be able to rely upon and cooperate for the promotion of peace, security, stability, and welfare of the Eastern Mediterranean and the wide region in the Middle East. In the Middle East. You need partners in the area that will be security producers, not security consumers. Not to consume security, but to produce it. OK? We will, will further the European values and ideas through engagement and partnership with all stakeholders in the region. No talking town down to anybody. Because geographically, as we see in the map, Europe is up. They look down. 
and they see, what do they see? We see Libya, we see all the countries, you don't look down on people. You engage as a true stakeholder from one to another. Egypt is known as Umm el Dunya, the mother of all nations. You come to Egypt with great respect. You come to the Arab world with great respect and tolerance through a joint dialogue. So we are both stakeholders, European Union and the countries in the region. Uh, Cyprus belongs to the Western security system, even though not part of NATO. Okay? We applied to, jo to join the PFP, and we are still waiting to get an answer. Uh, we will remain, and we are anchored in the, in the Western security system, no matter what happens, because we are EU members, so no matter, happen no matter what happens, we will remain EU members. But it's also because it is the only place where we see our interests lie and our own survivability. Okay? Um, uh, we have excellent relations with all countries in the region, except regrettably one, Turkey, which has been a troubled, a very, very troubled relationship, and I will say some few things about it. I'm not going to shy from it, and I'm not going to dance around the issue. Uh, but I'm not here for bashing. Because if I were here for bashing, I have 10 things to tell you that is happening every day in my biggest neighbor, which do not get well and which will go contrary to EU values and, and their team. I'm not here to do that. Okay. Um, okay, and that Cyprus has proven time after uh, again, and I will also show you some examples, that, that it can be uh, uh, um, a constructive, predictable, and, and, and have a British regional uh, role thereby contributing to security and stability. Now, we are a stabilizing factor and a security producer when we're fighting asymmetrical threats like terrorism, proliferation of weapons of mass destruction, human and drug trafficking, and organized crime. And this we're not obviously doing alone. No island is an island. No country uh, can do it alone. The United States, the biggest country, cannot do it alone. So it is interconnected and it is one feeding upon the other. Uh, some examples, we, we of course give ports, airports, hospitals and other logistical supports for various operations. One such successful operation was the destruction of the Syrian chemical weapons arsenal through the OPCW region which had its headquarters in Cyprus. And all the ships were going through Cyprus, including by the way Russian ships and Chinese ships at times. Staging ground for headquarters of Unifil Unif operation in Lebanon. That is stationed in Cyprus. Humanitarian evacuations in Lebanon in 2006. More than 60,000 citizens of third countries evacuated through, through Cyprus. And during my time as political director, two times uh, uh, as political director in the by Ministry of Foreign Affairs, I can tell you, but I'm not at liberty to say publicly, what we have done, uh, uh, also things that are not really to be made public. Uh, but we can achieve greater relevance and optimize its contribution through a solution. Because right now, we are de facto divided. Is everybody with me, or am I losing people? Thank you. Uh, Turkey, of course, is strategically very, very important country. If anybody doubts it, one look at the map will convince you. It's a big country, it is a pivotal country, strategically very important. Very important. <coughs> Basic axiom in foreign policy is that every country pursues its own national interest. Fair enough. This is kosher. This is halal. Everybody pursues their national interest. Fine. Turkey is a strategically important country in the region, but historically and on numerous occasions has followed its own national interests. That's also fair enough. Okay. But they were not always in line with those of the EU or the West. Whether that was World War One, whether it was whether it was most recently this ambivalence, whether we fight ISIS or we do not fight ISIS. Or part of, or it's easy for somebody that is outside to make criticize, but Turkey is there, knows the region, and takes its decisions. Fair enough. Respectable, I respect it uh, 100%. But at the same time, Turkey is an EU accident country. EU accident country. And when you're accident country, it is not the accident country that is that it is not the European Union that is joining the accident country, but the accident country 
joining the European Union. It is not the European Union joining Turkey, but Turkey joining the European Union, which means you have to align yourself. We all go through it. My colleague from Lithuania can attest to it. Every one of us that goes through it, and don't talk about Luxembourg because Luxembourg was a founding member of, 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 of the EU, of the coal uh, steel and then the EU. So we have to go through. The European Union gives. The XED country takes. You, you don't negotiate the IKEA. You don't negotiate the IKEA. By IKEA, I mean the body of the rules and regulations governing the European Union. You can negotiate transitional measures, yes. But you do not negotiate the IKEA such. And here we have 29% record alignment with EU common positions on foreign policy. So when sometimes people come to me and say, ah, you, Cyprus, you're blocking this and you're blocking the other, you're losing Turkey. My answer to this is that Turkey is losing Turkey vis-a-vis -vis the European Union. Pursuing its own national interests. Like I said, I'm not here to do bash it. Okay, next one. Now, let me come to the status quo. I did say about Cyprus, I did say about the, what the European Union is, I did say about the enlargement. Now let me come to the status quo in Cyprus, which remains unacceptable. Why does it remain unacceptable? Because historically, the, the uh, divisions have always been sources of instability and conflict, whether Vietnam, prior to the 1975 reunification, whether Yemen, my brother here from Yemen can attest, Ireland, Germany. Now, no two situations are alike, but no two situations are exactly different either. There is a connecting thread in all. The de facto division of Cyprus is no different. First, and foremost, I can answer it. <laughs> First and foremost, of course, the situation is lose lose for the people themselves, for the Cypriots. Status quo is not is not sustainable. Invasions, mini, military occupations cannot be sanctioned. Just because a country is big, I will give you the license. Is it the message? Uh, <laughs> the question? <laughs> uh, peace is not the absence of war. Because I said to me, you have peace in Cyprus. My answer is that you also have peace in cemeteries. But it does not take away from the fact that, that, that it is a cemetery. So peace is not the absence of war. An honorable, fair, just, and functional solution to the Cyprus problem will prove to, to be first and foremost win-win, first and foremost for the people, and not only for them, but for security and stability in the region. Next one, please. Thank you, sir. <laughs> I talk about the Cyprus's EU predictability, credibility, reliability, but that predictability can be neutralized if the solution is not the correct one. The Iron Plan that was voted down basically gave the right of a third country, Turkey, and to a lesser extent Greece, but also third countries, okay, to determine the foreign policy of a reunited Cyprus. I've said to you how important the European Union is, said to you that Cyprus is a, I try to articulate that Cyprus is a security producer country, you need to have predictability, we know where Cyprus is, but this predictability, this reliability, this credibility can be neutralized with a flood agreement. What was in the, the, the Anna Plan 2004 that was voted down? Cyprus shall not put its territory at the disposal of international military operations other than with the consent of both constituent states until the accession of Turkey to the European Union. I hope it will happen tomorrow, but it might not. The consent of Greece and Turkey shall also be required. Now, this is for me, ladies and gentlemen, dear friends, for me, this is a neo-colonialist article. A neo-colonialist, it's, it's not 2015. It's not for a country member of the European Union. I'm sorry. And I voted against the plan. And my heart still bleeds because it was, it was a chance that should have been handled differently. There are lessons learned, but that's another lecture. And I'm not here for the other lecture. I'm here to connect the dots together. Such a solution is above with this article that I read to you about and so many other things. It was 10,000 pages. My God, 10,000 pages. We'll, we'll lose 
every credibility that we have, every predictability, we will be under a colonialist regime. It cannot have it. I'm sorry. It cannot have it. Please. So the philosophy, therefore, the philosophy and structure of the solution is strategically very important. Does not only matter to Cyprus. It matters uh, in the countries in the region. The EU, it matters to the EU, including the United Kingdom and the international community. It matters to Israel. Because Israel, Israel also tells us, Israel, if you look at the map, cannot go north, cannot go south, cannot go east. It has always been west. And it has been through our own sea lanes. And the Israelis are telling us that, listen, we want to have a predictable partner in the Eastern Mediterranean. Because if it falls into unfriendly hands or potentially unfriendly hands, this is not good with, for our survivability. And this is not just me talking so. Talking, uh, talking so. It is their doctrine and their dogma. And Ben Gurion himself articulated it very early on. So the solution must ensure that Cyprus will continue to play this role, not provide for any third country the right to dictate decisions, uh, anachronistic to have so-called powers, i.e. Turkey, Greece, and the United Kingdom, with unilateral rights of intervention. That was 1960. And that proved to be fatal for the people themselves. I'm not putting all the current of powers into the same basket. Of course not. But the system itself did not, was not in the interest of the people themselves. Go back, and I'll say what I have to say, because I did say I'm an honest man came here to be honest. Greece, at the time of the junta, created havoc through a terrorist organization called the Eoga which 67, 74, had insubordination and subversion. That was a military junta in which the, the Greek people themselves were suffering, and in which Secretary Kissinger is on record as saying it is the best goddamn Greek government in Athens since the age of Pericles. That was the time then. But no. Turkey finds, the, finds the, uh, the putsch as an excuse, invades, and to this day causes havoc. Almost 40% of the uh, island under occupation. And, 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 the, and the United Kingdom, uh, of course, has not invaded. <laughs> Okay, or anything of that sort, but you know, could have done more and did not. Uh, the next one, please. Now, what I did fail to say that when we are talking about the Republic of Cyprus, and I think it wasn't the talking points, but I skipped it. Uh, um, uh, when we're talking about the Republic of Cyprus as a subject of international law, we're talking about east, west, north, south, all the territory of Cyprus, except the two British bases. Britain has retained, since the 1960s, two sovereign bases on the island. But when we're talking about the Republic of Cyprus, it is everything, like I said, eastern, southern, northern, western, but not the bases. And even though Cyprus and the United Kingdom are members of the, uh, of the EU, the bases are not part of the EU. Even though the euro is a legal tender in the bases, the United Kingdom doesn't have. Of course, the euro is a legal tender. Some people say, very good. That was a very good foresight. <laughs> that was very uh, forward-looking. Now, very few, thing, few things about uh, the, the intercommunal talks, because I think it's already 7 o'clock. And, and uh, 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 Professor, how long? Yes. Huh? We're OK? Yeah. Anyhow, just to say that the negotiation started in February 2004, uh, the 2014, following an agreement of the leaders of the two main communities. Now, the, the talks are intercommunal talks between the communities, and that's how they're emanating from the from the uh, uh, from the Security Council. Uh, uh, Eighty percent of the population are Cypriots of Greek ethnic background. Eighteen percent um, of of, uh, of Cypriots of Turkish ethnic background. Armenians, Maronites, like everybody, everybody is very very proud of their own uh, heritage, and that's the way it should be. The joint declaration talks about a, a reunited Cyprus on the basis of a bicommunal, by zonal federal state with political equality, uh, political equality as set out in different agreements. Uh, um, OK, next slide, please. Uh, like I said, even though the negotiations are between the leaders of the two communities, as mandated by the United Nations Security Council, resolutions, Turkey, as an occupied power, <coughs> close to 40,000 uh, troops there, remains there's an army here, the key to the solution of the Cyprus problem. So when they tell us 
um, okay, your counterparts are, are, the, are, the, are the Cypriots of Turkish ethnic background? Yes, of course. It's our homeland. It is, we have to come to an agreement. Of course, no question about it. But it is not Cypriots that invaded themselves. Turkey is, has the key. And it has to come on board with a win-win situation for Turkey as well. Uh, uh, negotiations were suspended in, in, in October 2014. Next one, please. Different phases of the intercommunal talks. First phase, that, that was a screening. Second phase, substantive, uh, more substantive phase. Uh, uh, and we were ready to go on, on the third phase when there was a deadlock. Uh, there are significant distances on, on the sides. Territory, 37.6% remains under military occupation. Property of internally displaced persons, of refugees. Security, that I talked to you about, because you have a colonial system, like I said, a double security problem on the island. Because if one community wants to be absolute secure, it means the other community is absolutely insecure, and vice versa. So you have to devise a system that it is, is it going to be military based or is it going to be like it is in, in the European Union today where you have the values and the principles that guide you? Is today, as a, a, a country in the European Union, may I use Luxembourg uh, with the permission, with the permission of the ambassador, is today Luxembourg safe in the European Union because it has such a great military deterrence against a possible <coughs> attack from, from Germany, which nobody or one of us can think? No. Security nowadays is not military security. Security nowadays is a much, much wider uh, concept. Okay? Now, security settlers. Uh, settlers, EU, because we have uh, uh, EU, like I said, it has to be the law of the land. Another one, please, quickly. Uh, Alexander Downer, who is currently the, the High Commissioner of Australia, was, uh, was the uh, special advisor. He concluded his term. Now we have a new advisor from Norway, Esper uh, Barth uh, Eide. Um, he broke the deadlock of the methodology of the third phase. We were ready to go in it. Next one, please. Uh, uh, um, uh, another one. OK. We were ready to go to, to, to the third uh, phase of the negotiation to, talk, to discuss those things that, we, that I told you about that we disagree when enough text came. What is an AFTEX? It's an international automated service of delivery to navigation and meteorological warning to, to seamen. Okay? Uh, with that NAFTEX, Turkey entered Cyprus's economic zone and started exploring exploitation. This is on the southern part of the Republic. Please, the next slide. Uh, exclusive economic zone of Cyprus was proclaimed in 2004. It has 13 blocks. Here it is. He, uh, Solon, uh, go back, please. Uh, he, here it is, exclusive economic zone. Okay, uh, and these are the blocks for for uh, for the hydrocarbons. Next one. This is another one here, with with some numbers as to how many uh, gas uh, it, uh, in the Eastern Mediterranean. The next one, please, because I want to start going. We have delimited our exclusive economic zone with Egypt, 2003. Lebanon, 2007, State of Israel, 2010. These delimitations here are now part of customary international law because they have been ratified with the exception of Lebanon. Lebanon has yet to ratify, has signed, but gets to ratify because of internal uh, problems that they have. Uh, but it, 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 it's going through. Uh, uh, deposited with the, with, the, with the Secretary General of the United Nations. OK? Um, Right. And the dotted lines have yet to be delimited. And of course, the northern part is the occupied part. And, and, and there we do not have a, 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 a de facto jurisdiction, only the Europe. And an, another thing that I also meant to say that the northern occupied part of Cyprus is still part of the EU. Huh? What we said about it. It's just the IT is suspended for the moment, even though all citizens, uh, the, they are members of the EU. Uh, so please. Okay, okay. We have every right, of course, to to explore the exclusive economic zone, and that right is recognized by everyone. Next one, please. We have given 
these plots to Korean company, to Italian, to French, to to uh, to uh, to American. Please. Uh, with its NAFTEX, Turkey designated certain certain part of our own exclusive economic zone. I repeat, in the southern part. Next, please. Here it is. I showed to you what it was. What he did. Here is what they what what, what they uh, they did, and they started exploring, exploiting on those on, on the red area. Please uh, go back, please. And this this what you see here is the, the flight information region that we talked to you about. So when a plane comes in, they have to get permission and all these things that you know about. Next one, please. Again, this is a more clearer map of what happened. Here is. Up here is the exclusive economic zone, and these dotted lines around is the territorial sea. Yes. The Turkish narrative is that they have not signed the, the Londres Convention, therefore they are not obliged by its, or by, by its uh, uh, rules and regulations. Islands do not have a continental shelf, and of course they say, based on the 1960 agreements, Greek Cypriots and Turkish Cypriots are co-owners co of the <coughs> island, therefore co-owners of the natural resources of Cyprus, which is correct. Which is correct. Uh, now, uh, all activities, but since they do not recognize Cyprus, they say that all, all activities uh, um, are illegal because the so-called Turkish Republic of Northern Cyprus has not given its consent. And I said to you that the Turkish Republic of Northern Cyprus, so-called, is not recognized by anyone uh, uh, but uh, by, by Turkey, which has created it and maintains it. Please. Then the Barbaros vessel, which is a Turkish oil vessel, goes into Cyprus, into Cyprus cruising economic zone, starts exploring, exploiting. The president had no other choice, a very, very rare occasion in which the president unanimous support of the political parties, they said, listen, we cannot go on. We cannot go to the third phase. See, we cannot go forward because we have all these illegal activities happening on Cyprus to the economic zone. It is inconceivable for any side in any negotiation to be expected to negotiate under duress, the threat of the use of force and blackmail. Next, please. Cyprus's response to the claims, uh, 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 the president has said on more than one occasion that all the natural resources belong to the entire people. That's why I said to you previously. Uh, 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 and not to any single community. The responsibility for managing the natural wealth lies with the government of the time for the benefit of the legal residents of the country. There was actually, in fact, an agreement, a convergence on the talks that all the natural resources, whether <coughs> on land or off land, they belong to the people, belong to the central government. Fair enough. That's, I mean, that nobody's saying anything differently. Uh, uh, <coughs> with the solution of the Cyprus problem, it will undoubtedly, of course, things will get uh, uh, much better. But the Turkish's actions at the time was, uh, it, it was bad because then uh, we, we had to postpone uh, at, the, at the crucial, crucial time of the talks. Please, because we, I don't want to be, I want my friends to listen to us again because it will take too long. <laughs> <laughs> They're going to get tired. And then, then, then. Now, on 15, 5 August, uh, 5 January 2015, the president made another proposal to the effect that we can discuss this in the talks, but at the end of the talks, actually there was also an agreement of how much money would go into an accrued in, into a school account, or like Norway has. Okay, uh, go on, so on, please. Uh, but instead of going forward uh, with, uh, with with this, there was another. There was a new NAFTEX that was uh, that was uh, issued, which uh, uh, expired at the beginning of, of April, which brings us now to, to May. Uh, as a result of this, the, the negotiations did not resume again. Please. Now, we have a positive development because recently the Turkish Cypriot community voted in a moderate, Mr. Mustafa Akinjin, with overwhelming support. That augurs well. He's a courageous man, he has a good track record on rapprochement and reconciliation. The UN and uh, the UN Special Advisor Aide will be arriving on the island this, this coming Monday to discuss the re immediate reception of the intercommunal talks, a meeting between the President and 
uh, and, and, uh, and uh, the Turkish Cypriot leader, Mr. Akinji, will take place sometime next week, immediately. And this direct, uh, the voting was done in Sunday. Sunday and today is Thursday. Friends, again another lesson for the EU. When you change the context, you change the problem. So said one of the founding fathers of the EU, Jean Monnet. The context in the Cyprus problem has been changed. By virtue of EU membership, there is a paradigm shift. Millions of crossing sacks all across the ceasefire line in Cyprus, incident free. I think that speaks volumes of what the people want. Cypriots cannot remain prisoners of the past. They are not children of a lesser God. And we are all baked under the same sun. As Cypriots, we may be able to disagree about the history. We may be able to disagree about the past. But I want us to agree about the, fut about the history of the future. <coughs> the vision that we have for our country as we see it 10, 15, 15 years ahead of time. A common vision about the single motherland, the country itself. We have to turn the pages without tearing them up. We have to move forward. Please. Sorry. Oh, we did? Okay. But again, when people say to me, okay, it's a, a matter between Greek Cypriots and Turkish Cypriots, come on, get your act together because the problem has been going for such a long time. I can understand. I can understand a certain sense of fatigue. We come back to square one because Turkey still holds the key to a solution. Even though the talks are in the communal, the key remains in Ankara. Prime Minister Davutoglu's book, anybody that is interested on Turkish foreign policy, please read Strategic Depth. It is the blueprint of Turkish foreign policy on Cyprus as well. It shows the mindset, the Weltanschauung, from which policies have been emanating. What does it say about Cyprus? Mr. Davutoglu was foreign minister and now esteemed uh, 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 the prime minister. Cyprus is in Turkey's vital space. Even if there is no Muslim Turk in Cyprus, Muslim Turk, not even Turkish Cypriot, Muslim Turk, Turkey will still maintain a Cyprus problem. No country can be indifferent to such an island which finds itself in the heart of its own vital space. I'm giving it to you verbatim. Idle space, any European should get chills a piece of her spine. This is Levin's wrong. And we know what that brought us. Next one, please. Huh? Is it finished? Ah, uh, what was President Erdogan's reaction to Mr. Akinji when he won, he, when he won the vote? Because Mr. Akinji, like I said, courageous man, he said, listen, well, I'm not going to fight Turkey but I'm not going to be submissive to it. We have to grow up. If Turkey was, was our mother, we have grown up. And if Greece was our mother, we have grown up. Thank you very much. When you have children, when your children grow up, you let them go. Go. OK? Now, then Mr. Mr. Erdogan, two days ago, what does he say? And I still haven't verbatim. Do his ears hear what he says? For Turkey, Northern Cyprus is our baby. We will continue to look at it the way a mother looks at her baby. No, we're 50 years old, come on. We're ready to retire. <laughs> <laughs> After all those sacrifices, we consider Turkish, Turkish Cyprus an offspring nation. How can he, Akinje, have stopped considering Turkey as a mother now? Sacrilegious. Mr. Akinje, sacrilegious is my <laughs> Mr. Akhirchi will not continue the negotiations according to his own understanding. There is an answer here. These issues in the negotiations are not matters that he will agree, he will be agreed without being discussed first with the Garanto countries. Mr. Akhirchi will not do this work, talks, his, this work, I mean the talks in his own way. And I think here you have an answer to all those that say, Cypriots get your act together. Of course, we have to get our act together. But you know what? In my heart of hearts, I know that we have that act together. 
because of virtue of the, of, the, of the European Union. Because if the European Union has managed to do all these things that I talked to you about for the entire continent, it will not be able to do it for, for a small country like Cyprus. Come on, give me a break. Next one, please. Now, I close up. Uh, and, and, and that's enough, I've talked more than enough. Hydrocarbons, we come back to the hydrocarbons. Why? Because it can be a game changer. Why, in the same way that coal and steel was for, for, the, for Europe after World War II, which ultimately brought the European Union peace, stability, and prosperity in Europe. This is the vision. Now, when people were talking about the coal and steel after World War II, building, constructing the European, co constructing the European Union, everybody thought they were crazy. Everybody thought they were crazy, but it happened. Brick by brick, and it can happen in the Eastern Mediterranean as well, because you will have overlapping interests to energy. Next slide, please. Can be achieved through political will, spirit of cooperation, willingness to build trust, etc. Next. The role of Cyprus in the region comes by virtue of its EU membership. Closer cooperation with other like-minded countries like Egypt, Israel, Lebanon, Jordan as well. Palestine. Yesterday we had a summit, the second summit, between the president of Cyprus, the president of Egypt, and, all, and also the, 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 the Greek prime minister. Please. So, the unification of Cyprus will allow it to achieve its full potential on all these things that I described to you about. Uh, a unification of the land will, and the normalization of relations with Turkey will have a very, very important collateral effect on achieving all these things that we talked about, first and foremost for the people and for everything else. Are we just about finished? Thank you? Okay. Now, uh, it means positive things for the region, of course, because without the solution of the problem, we, we find ourselves in a lose-lose situation. Next. I could not resist. I can resist everything but temptation, as, uh, as it was said. A great man, uh, Winston Churchill, who said, the pessimist sees difficulty in every opportunity, whereas the optimist sees the opportunity in every difficulty. This is what we're trying to do. OK? So, and I close with these things, ready and able to answer your questions. I'm sorry if it took me such a long time to, to, to do these things. I was really thinking hard, but I want to connect the dots. Because if I were just going to take you just what is happening in the negotiations alone, it doesn't really make much, much sense. Thank you. Michael Carey from Cambridge University. Uh, could you tell us a little bit about the development of your uh, new relationship with Russia? There's a very close financial relationship with Russia. Uh, as a result, even though you say that your membership of the EU is very important to Cyprus, you are not supporting the EU. Your prime minister is, is uh, not supporting sanctions against Russia, uh, uh, even now that Russia has invaded Europe with its military. Um, so could you tell us what you think will happen uh, from the Cypriot point of view in the coming conflict, which might become quite serious, between Europe and Russia? Whose side are you on? Good. I like the question. <laughs> I like the question. Good. That's when I said I came here for another easy time. Oh, the gentleman here. Whatever is on your mind. Hi, Commissioner. Uh, Jason Trelan, this, um, a lawyer, local counsel in North London, and the chairman of the Conservative Friends of Cyprus. Um, I wanted to ask specifically about the relationship uh, between Britain and Cyprus. Yeah. Um, of course, you, you touched on it, and, and Britain has always been a steadfast ally of Cyprus. In '83, when the TRNC was declared, Margaret Thatcher came out saying we never recognise this state. Most recently, in 2013, William Hague was the first foreign minister, to, uh, first foreign uh, sort of uh, civil servant to call. Uh, President Assad is to offer British support for the financial troubles, and there's been a lot of time to offered. And my question is specifically, what more? Of course, Britain is playing an important role behind the scenes with the settlement talk, but what more can Britain do uh, politically, diplomatically, to assist with the um, with the negotiation of the Cyprus problem? Good, thank you. Uh, let me take uh, um, the, the Russia question first. I appreciate it. Uh, your, your name again, please. Michael. Michael. I appreciate it, Michael, uh, because all, all these things have to uh, have to come out. Uh, 
we have joined, we are members of the European Union, and when the European Union, the European Council, or the Foreign Affairs Council decides something with our own participation, it's part of our policy. So when it comes to Russia, annexation of Crimea, what is happening in Ukraine, Cyprus does not have any other position, does not have any other uh, uh, policy other than that of, of the European Union, which is against the annexation. It is in favor of the territorial integrity, sovereignty of Ukraine, Georgia. It cannot be anything different for us. Now, on the sanctions, we have supported sanctions. My hunch is that in June, the sanctions will be again renewed. I do not know if there will be new sanctions. I think that's, that remains to be seen. I think there will be a, tech, a technical rollover. We're doing it so, and I must also be fair and correct with you, uh, 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 we're suffering in doing so. Because we are not such a big country like the United Kingdom, of course, where you have shock absorbers. You know, we don't have a city. We don't have, uh, 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 well, uh, uh, so many thing, uh, things. Things, when you are small, you feel a lot more the road bumps. And we are saying, and, and what my minister has said, what my president has said, listen, okay, we should also not be hurting ourselves through sanctions. At the same time, we are part of it. We're not going to change because we are a family. Uh, uh, we're not going to be divided on these issues. It's not easy sometimes because it's 28 member states in the European Union as opposed to, let's say, the United States, which can decide by itself. I mean, I served in the United States. I mean, Kissinger used to say, well, give me a telephone number so I can call uh, Europe so I can get an answer. I, I would turn that around and I'll say sometimes, give me a telephone number. Who, who, who shall I call in, in Washington, D.C.? Is it the Department of State? Is it the NSC? Is it the, the Ministry of Defense? I do not know. But anyhow, the European Union is, it is what it is. But I'm answering your question as to Russian money, as to Russian mafia. Listen, uh, they are everywhere. They are everywhere, OK? Shall I ask you, don't look too far away? I mean, I'm still a diplomat. I still want to have a job. We should go after them. We should go anybody that does money laundering. Money laundering is an international scourge. Because through money laundering, the financing terrorism, and I don't know so, so many things. But it's, it's, it's happening. We have put a lot of our house in order, but we have had the st stress test. May I get personal? I've been working ever since I was 12 years old. Under any circumstances, it would have been as child labor. I worked very hard. I like to think of myself as a law-abiding citizen, paying my taxes. I went to bed on a Friday, thinking that I'm secure in my retirement, and on Monday, my money was gone. I do not know if a Hitler or a Stalin actually ever did that. Okay? If they wanted to go after the money launderers, let them go after the money launderers. So we have to also put all these things into perspective because there was this so-called uh, bail-in because they say, well, we have to find the Russian mafia. Find it. Go after them. Don't go after law-abiding citizens. It was highway robbery. So I do not know if I'm answering your question, but I hope you're satisfied enough. If not, let's talk about it afterwards. Yeah. Uh, the gentleman... Uh, Ah, yes, yes, of course. Uh, Jason, Jason, yes. Uh, it's an umbilical relationship. It's an umbilical relationship with the United Kingdom. Uh, we have had our ups and downs. I have to be fair and correct. But you also have up and, uh, up and downs with your own family and with your own uh, um, uh, brothers, sisters. The qualitative difference now than before is that we are partners in the European Union. We find ourselves in the same strategic boat as the United Kingdom in the Eastern Mediterranean. The bases, which I talked to you about before, are vestiges of colonialism, yes, okay? But at the same time, it, is, it was 50 years ago. The bases also now serve our own interests as well, because I repeat, we are in the same strategic boat. Uh, the United Kingdom helped in our accession to the European Union, which I come back to it, the, the single most important uh, strategic development is independence. What it can do more, it has its own interests. 
it has its own limitations. What often hurts me, of what is sometimes happening in London, happening in Washington, because when I was in a previous life, I was ambassador there, is, again, in a sense, I can understand it, of course, because countries pursue their own interests, but I do not want my country to be viewed through the prism of the relations, for instance, with another big country. Because if you view that, then it is lopsided. Then we don't change that. I want it to be on its own merits. Because what we actually want, I don't think is anything that anybody else wants. What, what is good for 27 members of the European Union should be good to go for, for the 28. And what do people want in Gaza, in Palestine, in, in Cyprus? What do Cypriot, Greek Cypriot want? Listen, guys, five things. Security. Healthcare, uh, healthcare system, economic opportunities, less taxes. Send their kids to school. That's what people want. We can do it, and it can be done. And the United Kingdom has been helping with that. I mean, if we have a, uh, um, they left us a good administration in Cyprus. And in many ways, we messed it up. So that has to be said. But also what needs to be said is that many of the divisions that we have were also part and parcel of the 1960 agreements. Because our friends here in London, and it's not a cliche, divided and ruled. Well, whether it was Cyprus in some ways, in India, and Palestine, and stuff like that. I won't do it on a positive note, of course. It's not, but we have to take that into consideration. So uh, we have wonderful relations. The president came here in, in January. We have signed some very good agreements that are being, being implemented. And in the implementation phase, my colleagues uh, suffer from my. Uh, from my anxiety to push things uh, forward. So I want to pay tribute to them as well. Thank you very much, High Commissioner. I think um, let's leave time to the networking which can take place outside. The High Commissioner would be very happy to answer any of your questions one to one. Thank you very, very much for coming. <laughs>